Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to week two of our Wednesday night study about Elijah. If you're just stumbling onto this, we started this study last week. We finished up Noah a couple of weeks ago, and I caught my breath, and then here we go again. And we're staying here in the Old Testament just because the stories are so rich, and I really love going back and being able to see what we can learn from these Bible heroes and these Bible stories. So last week, we started reading about Elijah. If you missed last week, I really want to encourage you to go back and find that. You can probably find it right there on the side of your screen, but if you go back and click that, you can get a lot of background into the story, which I'm not going to go back much and repeat today. But instead, I just want to pick up, and we're going to dive in, and I want to pick up right here. When you think of Elijah, do you have like an image that comes to your mind? And of course, if you didn't grow up in church or Bible school or something like that, then, then it could be that that triggers nothing for you. But if you grew up like I did going to Sunday school, then you probably saw like flannel graph pictures of Elijah the prophet, you know, standing on Mount Carmel, challenging the Baal prophets and, tr and trusting God. And there was fire from heaven. I mean, maybe you think of a man of prayer or a great miracle worker or maybe even one of the men who appeared with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. I mean, this guy Elijah was a hero, the kind of guy that I pray that God will mold me into because I want the kind of faith that I sometimes see him display. Of course, if you've ever prayed that God would mold you and transform you into someone with that kind of faith, then you probably know that's not really a neat process. I've shown videos in church before of my son pounding out metal or steel to make knife blades. You know, it's, it's, it's hot temperature and it's a lot of pressure. Well, God molds us in times like that. I mean, even in times and seasons like the ones that we're living in right now, God doesn't necessarily cause these things to happen. I mean, it's not like he brings bad things, but God uses them. I mean, if you've ever prayed and asked God, you know, to make me stronger, Lord, or help, help my prayer life become more effective or help my love grow deeper, and you kind of have one of those mountaintop moments, you know, I'm seeing God more clearly than I ever have seen him, and God, I just want you to mold me into this person. Well, what's happened, what happens a lot of times is that following that mountaintop moment, you come down into life and things go haywire. And pressure starts to set in and problems develop a lot without any solution that you can see. And you start to wonder what's going on here. Why is my world falling apart? God, where are you? Why are you so silent? What are you up to, God? And it's kind of hard to remember in those moments of extreme pressure or extreme trial, God actually may be answering your prayer. God actually may be using this moment for the purpose of molding and transforming you into the image of Christ. James kind of alludes to this in the beginning of his book. Look at the first verse of chapter 1. James said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Consider it joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Do you see what James is saying? He says, consider it a joy when you face all of these trials in life. And you and I say, a joy? Are you crazy? But James isn't saying, be happy that things are hard. He's not saying you should wake up in the morning and say, boy, I sure hope things fall apart for me today because some good stiff trials would really hit the spot. It's not that. James is saying that in those tough times, when the world really seems to be pushing in on you, that you're not alone. And that God can use those moments to help build perseverance in you, to strengthen you in your faith, to make you more mature. Now, here's why that concept is so important for this moment. Because I asked you a few minutes ago, what image comes to your mind when you hear about Elijah? And what I want you to know is that before Elijah could stand on Mount Carmel, he had to sit by the brook. And I'm going to explain what that means in just a second, but get the point that mature faith and ability that is required to handle the Mount Carmels of life is forged in the furnace of previous tests and trials. See, those types of experiences purify us and they build us 
and they teach us to trust God. And actually, we honestly, we don't enjoy those moments, but they're necessary for growth. The author of Hebrews says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, right? It's painful, but it produces a harvest of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. So tonight, we're going to look at this moment that God started to mold Elijah, or at least take the next step in molding Elijah so that he could lead Israel. Before God used Elijah to transform Israel, he wanted to transform Elijah. Now, I don't have a TV on either side of me right now. I don't have these verses to show you. Instead, what I really hope that you'll do is follow along in your Bible. And so, thank goodness you can hit pause right now and go get your Bible. I really need you to be able to read with me because my voice will put you to sleep. I know that. But if you could have your Bible and a pen and take some notes while we, go, while we do this, that would be great. So if you'll go get that, then come back and hit play and let's get at it. 1 Kings 17.1. That's where we're going to be. 1 Kings 17.1. Find 1 Kings Old Testament 17.1. Here's what it says. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, we talked about this verse last week. In fact, it's the only verse, really, that I read with you about Elijah last week. So I'm not going to say much today except to remind you what's happening. Last week, we talked about King Ahab. And of course, Ahab was just another in a long line of godless kings in Israel. They just lined up and it seemed like each king was just a little worse than the one that came before. So that when Ahab took the throne, things were especially bad in Israel. In fact, last week I showed you the verse at the end of 1 Kings 16 that says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger then did all the kings of Israel before him. Do you remember what he did? Ahab married Jezebel, who brought with her Baal worship. And so she introduced Baal worship to the nation, and it turned, it turned on the people of God because all of these people now suddenly turned to Baal. They turned away from God. They were constructing temples to Baal and hiring priests to Baal and Asherah poles, who's Baal's mom. And there were child sacrifices and sexual immorality and so much bad that was happening. So that by the end last week, we were saying Israel needed a hero. Things were bleak. They needed a hero. And then onto the scene stepped Elijah. And suddenly, he kind of appeared. It was a sort of a dramatic moment where he just confronts King Ahab and he says, no more rain until I say so. Which wasn't just a challenge to the king. It was a direct challenge to Baal because Baal was the god of rain. And by the way, I think the word that Ahab probably zeroed in on was Elijah's pronouncement of years. That there will not be more rain for years Okay, the people of Israel could withstand a few dry weeks, maybe in a few dry months. I mean, the wells weren't going to dry up immediately, right? Lack of rainfall isn't exactly rare in that part of the world, but it's different when you start talking about years. I mean, there's no way around it. This was a life-threatening pronouncement. So at the conclusion of this moment, if you were Elijah and you were standing before the king and this is your pronouncement, what would you have done next? Wouldn't you if, you, if you think about it, wouldn't you think that God would send Elijah into the town to warn people of impending disaster? That here he goes and says, watch out people. I mean, that's what I would have thought if I was writing the script. Maybe Elijah could have performed a miracle like Moses or maybe he could have given the king like a divine countdown, change your ways by this mark or something like that. At the least you would expect that God would keep Elijah in Ahab's face, you know, confronting his wicked ways and pressing for change. So much for human logic. Here's what happened. 1 Kings 17, verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kirith Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kirith Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the book. So at this crucial dramatic moment, God sent Elijah 
from the palace to a carefully chosen hiding place. He's out of the public spotlight. He's in total obscurity. Now, why did God do that? I mean, he's not hiding from Ahab. I don't think that's what happened because he's going to confront him again later. You're going to see that and come out unharmed. God told Elijah to hide, to conceal himself, but not out of fear. And see, I don't think this is, is probably easy to hear, but Elijah is going from being in the midst of everything to being in the midst of nothing. And the reason is because God wants to work on him. And to do that, Elijah has to be by himself. Like when Jesus left and went out in the wilderness by himself. When's the last time you had one of those moments? You probably had one when you were, maybe you went camping with somebody or maybe it was at church camp or a church retreat. Sometimes we have to get out of the limelight and into the shadows so that we can really hear God's voice. But if going into hiding wasn't a tough enough pill to swallow for Elijah, look at verse four. Elijah is being fed every day by ravens. And he's drinking every day from this brook. I mean, you got to think Elijah's mind must be just blowing up right now. You want me to go where? You wanna, you're going to feed me how? But at this moment, God is, has Elijah out in the woods all by himself, and he is teaching him. He is showing him once and for all, Elijah, you can trust God. He is going to take care of your needs. I love the statement from A.W. Pink, the commentator. He said, the man whom the Lord uses has to be kept low. Severe discipline has to be experienced by him. Three more years must be spent by the prophet in seclusion. How humbling. Alas, how little is man to be trusted. How little is he able to bear being put in his place of honor. How quickly self rises to the surface and the instrument is ready to believe he is something more than an instrument. How sadly easy it is to make out of the very service God entrusts us with a pedestal on which to display ourselves. You see, what's happening here is that God is molding Elijah. He is teaching him that he is completely dependent on his father and that his heavenly father is completely trustworthy. And to his credit, Elijah obeyed. In fact, the word that you read there is that Elijah lived by the brook. We're not talking about like a camping trip. This isn't a few weeks in the wilderness. This isn't a backpacking trip. This isn't exhilarating. Elijah settled there. He stayed just like God told him to do. He said, yes, sir. I trust you completely. I don't need the spotlight to survive, and it's fine. That's hard for us, isn't it? See, lots of us enjoy a very comfortable and active Christianity. We like the public forum. We like to feel like we're indispensable to God's plans. But sometimes God wants us to pull back and regroup and rethink and renew our souls. And so for a while, things went well. And Elijah got bread and meat delivered twice a day. And he had cool water from the brook whenever he wanted. He could just lie on his belly and cup his hands around that water. Probably felt like he was living in some kind of a weird fantasy. Until one morning, things changed. And in verse 7, if you just slide your finger down, what you read is that one morning, Elijah noticed that the brook wasn't gushing over the rocks or bubbling as freely as it had before. And then over the next few days it was barely a trickle. And then one morning, there was no water at all, only wet sand. And after a while, even that dried up and hardened. Elijah suddenly had lost everything. Everything disappeared before his eyes. He was living here, obeying God. Here's food to eat. Here's water to drink. And now even that water has gone away. I think a lot of us understand that feeling to some extent. I mean, at least metaphorically speaking, lots of us have experienced that because here lately, we've lost a lot. Some people have gone from looking at full bank accounts and booming businesses and exciting careers to a brook that has dried up. Some people have seen a lot of things shaken that they took security in, that now those, that security has just dwindled away. 
At one time, it seemed like things were going great, and then the brook dried up. And I'm not really trying to oversell this concept, but I think we can all make a connection with Elijah and remember times when our brook dried up. And if you can remember that, then you know that those are the times that we question God because we don't see him very clearly. Lord, what are you up to? We don't understand him. You think you've got him all figured out, and then you find out you don't. And then suddenly, the brook is dry, and you're left saying, God, where have you gone? Have you forgotten me? Well, that's where Elijah was. And so I think this is the right time to ask the question, has God forgotten Elijah? He sent him to the wilderness, live right here. I'm going to feed you. Here's water. Do you think that God forgot Elijah? I mean, of course not, right? The answer to that is, of course not. God allowed Elijah's brook to, to dry up. But that doesn't mean he stopped caring or even that he stopped providing because God was still at work. And in fact, in that moment, Elijah was probably even more of a focus of concern than ever. Isaiah 49 has some really strong verses where God is making a promise to Israel. Listen to this. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. At the beginning of that, the people say, the Lord has forgotten us. He's forsaken us. He's forgotten us. And Isaiah says, there's no way that's true. I mean, can a mother forget her nursing baby? And of course, we would instinctively say, no way, that's impossible. Of course, if you watch the news, you know that sometimes that happens. Babies are abandoned, abused. It does happen. But Isaiah says, even if, even if that could happen, get this, not God. God will never forget us. In fact, Isaiah says we are like permanently inscribed on the palms of his hands. It's like if you can look at the palms of your hands and imagine that these are God's hands and that you are right there. One translation of the passage says, I have you tattooed on the palms of my hands. You're always before me. Every minute, God knows exactly what we're doing and how we're feeling. God never looks around and says, oh goodness, now where did I place Matthew? I'm always forgetting about him. No way. I'm a middle child. Everybody else might forget me, not God. I'm always before him and you are too. And when we end up beside a dry stream bed, God isn't caught by surprise. Instead, God looks at it and says, perfect. I can use this moment. In fact, I'm going to get you through it and you'll be stronger than you were before. And if you say, but God, this is too tough. It's, I mean, it was so much easier before. God is going to say, I know that. I see you. I haven't forgotten you. Trust me through this. And see, that kind of trust builds perseverance. In fact, let me just add one more little layer to this. For Elijah, this dried up brook was literally a direct result of his prayers in James 5, James said, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. I mean, that verse says that Elijah had been praying that God would hold back rain. And God did hold back rain. And now the dried up brook happened, but the dried up brook was a result of Elijah's own prayers. And see, my point in mentioning that is that we often do the same thing. I might pray, Lord, make me a godly man. Mold me, in, mold me into a man after your own heart. But what I'm really thinking is, but please don't let it hurt too much. You know, Lord, help me to rise above this disease of materialism, but don't make me give up my stuff. Lord, help me to overcome my pride, but ooh, don't let me do you too humbled either. I mean, we bargain with God. We seem to want instant maturity, not the kind that requires sacrifices or hardship of any kind. It's like that old saying, you know, Lord, grant me patience and please hurry. But understand that life with God has to include some sort of a denial of ourselves. We have to go through a boot camp of sorts. And God will mold us and he'll shape us and he will transform us into people who can do all kinds of awesome things for him. 
But that kind of molding probably includes fire and pressure. And it almost certainly means that God will strip us of our pride and give us a new kind of pride, one that is grounded in him. All right, so let me give you three quick applications. First of all, from the verses I just read, I just want you to know that you need to be willing sometimes to let God set you aside that you need to have moments where you can be still. Sometimes we struggle to hear God's voice until we get away and get still. If you haven't done that in a while, if you haven't just stopped and gotten still before the Lord, it might be time to do that now. Secondly, understand that God's direction includes God's provision. All right, in other words, if God gives you direction, he is going to take care of you while you do what he asks you to do. Remember that, that when God gave Elijah instructions, when he said go to the brook, there was also a promise there to provide for him. But the problem is that sometimes we don't understand how God is working. In the book, It Is Toward Evening, Vance Havner tells about a group of farmers who set all their hopes one year on the cotton. And then the dreaded boll weevil came and destroyed the crop. And it just really looked like they were ruined. But being resourceful, they made a last ditch decision to plant peanuts instead. And the peanut crop made them four times more than the cotton ever could. And in fact, the farmers erected a monument to the boll weevil, which was the very thing that they thought would destroy them. See, sometimes God uses these devastating things in life to jolt us awake and to teach us new ideas and to get us out of ruts. Every trial is an opportunity, but we have to trust God to provide. And that means one step at a time. Notice that God only told Elijah one step at a time. Go to Ahab, go to the brook, Okay, now I've got a plan here too. Step by step, let God lead. Which also means one more observation, that a dried up brook sometimes is not a sign of God's judgment. Sometimes it's a sign of God's pleasure. And what I mean by that is is that if you study the lives of all the great people in Scripture, you see that every single one passed through difficult and even grueling trials. Jesus had to pass through Gethsemane. And those trials aren't a sign that God is unhappy with you. On the contrary, he is ready to use them to build you up. It's just that he wants you to turn to him. And when you do, he builds in you perseverance. And eventually perseverance turns into maturity. And that's why the hero on top of Mount Carmel first had to spend some time beside a dried up brook. Next week, we'll read about what happened after that. Because God did have an after, of course. How did God take care of Elijah when the brook dried up? Next week, we'll see is a story that involves a widow, and it is a really powerful story. So I hope that you'll join next week. I'd like to pray for you right now. Lord, we are living in hard times right now in so many ways, Lord. Times that that are unprecedented, and those are hard, Lord. We all think we would all rather have precedented times. But then again, Lord, my prayer is that you would use these times and redeem them in a good way. Lord, that you'll make us stronger as a result of them, that you'll make us more focused as a result of them. Lord, that in the the craziness of this time, that you'll teach us to trust you all the more. Redirect us, recapture our hearts, ignite us, Lord. And Father, prepare us for the next thing that you have, the next step. And Jesus, help us to help us to keep our eyes on you until that step comes. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Hope you guys have a great week. I'll see you Sunday.